Sorry about that. I am Doug Soltes. I work for a company called Storage Made Easy. Today we're going to be talking about maximizing bandwidth when transferring media, healthcare, and life science files. Now, like every demo, I've got a little bit of uh, deck debt, and so uh, some of my animations are working a little bit strange. But I don't think I need to tell anybody that media files are very big. Uh, 4K movies are currently averaging about 100 gigabytes. Genomics files, so me, you, our joint genome is in the 80 to 90 gigabyte range. So you can imagine if we took everybody at this conference and we wanted to see what they had in common, we're talking about hundreds of terabytes of data. And so when you want to use that data, you need to use fast storage. Uh, that flash storage or fast storage is going to be used in genomics for things like alignment of the data. It's going to be for the researchers that are analyzing it. They're going to be using tools like Hadoop or Spark to analyze that data. Uh, when we're talking about media files, we're using things like transcoding. Transcoding is when I have that big 4K file, but I want to play it on my phone. I'm connected via my cellular network, and I need to downgrade that very quickly. Not to mention, when you're actually working on the movie files, the director needs to be with the editor they're picking the actual shots and scenes um, that they want to actually compose the, the true movie. And so in order to work with this data, we're using things like flash and object storage. So flash is the, the key one for when the data is actually being used. It's high IOPS, it's low latency, but it's high cost. And I know that some of the flash vendors are going to say, well, that's okay, we've got dedupe. Unfortunately, the files we're talking about today, they don't dedupe at all. They don't compress. So when you work with media files, media is already compressed. It's using things like H.264, H.265. When we're talking about genomes, what makes me different from somebody in the audience is one in a thousand base pairs. And a base pair is just your, you know, uh, one of those four uh, peptides, so A, C, uh, H, G. And so if you think about that, that's, that's one byte out of 1K is different. Most dedupe systems uh, they're, they're looking at the absolute smallest doing things at the 4K level, maybe the 8K level. And so having one different byte in, in a thousand is just going to completely break uh, dedupe and or compression. And so where is everybody turning? They're turning to object storage. Uh, obviously the chief object storage here at OpenStack is going to be OpenStack Swift, uh, but Ceph is also a darling. And what do they excel at? Well, they are very good at high concurrency. So what they want is to have a uh, internet facing protocol, maybe for the Rados gateway or for your Ceph proxies. That internet facing um, is going to be serving hundreds or thousands of users. Think Amazon S3, think of a, a video game system where everybody's loading and saving their games. Think Instagram, things like that. Where they don't excel is when I have a single really big file. When I've got that one big file, and I want to move it quickly, it's moving it probably at 30 to 50 megabytes a second because what does it do? It breaks it up across a number of hard drives and it's reading it, you know, linearly, sequentially. And so how do we change that? How do we change it so that that one file, instead of looking like one client accessing one file, looks like 10 or 100 or 1,000 clients accessing that 100 gigabyte 4K file? And the, the answer is twofold. When you're doing an upload, there are two mechanisms we're going to talk about when we're talking object API. With S3, we're talking multi-part upload, which is called MPU. When we're talking Swift API, we're talking SLO. And they're very similar. They're chunking the data into bits. When you chunk the data into bits, it's going to land on a number of spindles. And having it on a number of spindles is going to give you that high throughput that we're looking for. But then the problem comes when we start to download that data. So MPU and SLO are a good way to put the data up. But then when I'm trying to pull the data down, very few clients, in fact, I, I have it on my next slide, very few clients are actually able to do anything to accelerate that data on the way down. And so what we're looking at is the ability to take that data and do range reads, break it logically into segments, and still get that concurrency that we are looking for. And so the two tools that I am familiar with in the open uh, source community, they're CLI tools. One is called Swift Commander. I know a number of you are going to go, hey, wait a minute. Swift Client does parallel uploading of files. Well, that's true. It does SLOs, and it can do parallelism when uploading a, a, a whole directory full of files. 
But on the download side, it can parallel a number of files. But if I have a single large file, Swift client reads it from start to finish. So what Swift Commander is, it was donated to the community. It's in GitHub by Fred Hutch, their cancer research firm in the US. And they put a wrap around it. And that wrapper is going to do those range reads. It's going to give stubs. It only works with the Swift API, which is fine if that's your primary API. But maybe it's not fine if you're you know, your end users aren't capable or don't like using a CLI, or maybe you want to go Swift to S3. On the S3 side, Amazon has a client tool called AWS CLI. It's a very good tool. In fact, I've written a blog article not just on installing it on Mac, Windows, and Linux, but also on kind of making its syntax easier by, by aliasing it. So I, I would advise that you go out, you check those blog posts. And again, it's exclusively for S3 API, and it's going to be able to do the uploads and the downloads. When it does that, it's going to be doing it to a file system. And all this data is going to be flowing through your device. So if I have a laptop and I'm pulling down that, that 4K file and I'm using um, AWS CLI, it's all going through my laptop. I close my laptop, I'm offline. And so we have a number of clients that storage made easy in the media space, um, in the genomic space. And what they wanted was something that was enterprise grade. They wanted something that had a web GUI. They wanted native Windows tools. They wanted to be able to go Swift or S3 to file system or S3 to Swift. Some of them have Swift clusters. Some of them have Ceph clusters. Some of them have other clusters from, from people at the conference, such as uh, IBM, the, the IBM color, <coughs> the IBM cause clusters. They wanted this to run in the background. So they wanted to be able to open up a web GUI, tell it, I want to parallelize this, this movement of data from, let's say, my object store to my HCP um, you know, systems. And I want to be able to shut down my laptop. I don't want that data all flowing through it. And the, the last thing that they wanted was they don't want the storage to be publicly exposed. Now, Again, when you think about AWS CLI, well, of course, Amazon wrote it, knowing that their, their S3 is publicly exposed. But some you know, organizations are still a little bit uh, worried about publicly exposing their data, especially when you see all these articles today about S3 people, people unintentionally publicly exposing their data and, and making that, unfortunately, available to, to the world. So I'm going to do a couple of demos. Uh, the first demo I'm going to do is going to be Ceph to a SIFS migration. It's all going to be in one data center. So I have a rack set up in San Francisco. Uh, it's behind a firewall. And, and this is kind of common. This is what a lot of our clients have. They've got a, a object store. They've got um, some sort of flash storage, maybe pure, uh, solid fire. And they want to just move the data. They want it to be touch button. But it doesn't have to be like that. Uh, this same technology is going to accelerate your downloads even when the storage is not local to the cluster. And so for the, the second part of the demo, what I'm going to show you is a IBM COS system. Now this COS is in soft layer, is publicly exposed. It's in what we call US South. And so it, it's somewhere over maybe around Atlanta. And what we're going to have is a, a Windows client. We're going to have our file fabric still running in that same rack in San Francisco and pull the data across the country, still get the acceleration uh, benefits. And then lastly, you know, there's no reason that the client even has to be local to the, the file fabric. So the, the client could be, I also have a, a rack out in London, and so I can have the, the storage and the file fabric in the US, and this parallelization of the data is going to accelerate our transfers to, to London. So I've gone a little over on, on my time, but um, why don't, not on my time, but my time for my demo. So let's uh, immediately dive right into our demo. So again, uh, at Storage Made Easy, we have what we call File Fabric. The File Fabric uh, gives you a web interface view into your files. Um, it doesn't alter your data. We don't do anything proprietary to your data. So I can just point this at an existing object store, SIF store, whatever it is, index what's there. We just hold the metadata. Um, these are a number of DICOM images. DICOM images, let me, I open one up. DICOM images are, are like MRIs and whatnot. We, we do viewers for PDFs for you know, any of these different types of uh, files. Actually, I think one of the, the cooler ones is down here. Let's see. You know, we, can, we can play it with our DICOM viewer. So these are the kind of files it's downloading to Australia. 
<laughs> these are the kind of files that, that you know, we're working with on a daily basis. And so, switching back, I have a cluster here where I have Ceph Jewel. Can you guys see that? Okay, I want to make it a little bigger. Um, I have Ceph running Jewel. I've got some genomics file, a media file. I have my HCP cluster. This is connected via SIFS. Um, I have the IBM Cos storage that we talked about. That's in US South. And what I want to do is I want to move some of these um, data. Now, just to show you, uh, let's do IP track. To monitor the, the actual movement of the data through the file fabric interface, um, we're going to be looking at this number here. This is in kilobits, not kilobytes. So I know I've been talking kilobytes because generally what you do. But when we do networking, we'll talk in kilobits. So uh, generally, when I'm doing an S3 stream out of Ceph or out of Swift, I'm probably talking 30 to 50 megabit or megabytes per second because that's what drives I do. Um, if you want to do that translation, that's probably like 250 megabit, so about a quarter of a gig pipe. So the first thing I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to go into our Ceph cluster. Let's, let's do genomics because I've got bigger files here. I have a uh, four gig file right here, and I am just going to simply click and drag that with the um, interface, with the web interface. This is what a lot of researchers want. They want to actually work on this data on the SIFS cluster natively, and they want a tool where they can just click and drag. So that's saying build a background task, and then if I look over here, I can see that right now I'm doing about 2,500 megabits, so that's about a quarter of a gig pipe. So I've got about a 10x acceleration off of what we would see with a single stream of data from SIFS, or, uh, I'm sorry, from uh, Swift or S3. Now there's two reasons for this. The first one is the actual SIFS that I'm writing to, this is a, a 12 spindle free NAS, so you know, I'm limited uh, a little bit by that. The other thing was I, I was thinking about setting up a RAM drive so that you guys could really see it fly over a 10 gig network, but the demo kept running in under five seconds, and I went, I don't know if I can flip my screen that fast. All right, so, so we copied that file. Uh, now let's, let's do um, some of the file acceleration from the, uh, the IBM cause. So uh, we'll go in, we have the same genomic files. I'll take a one gig file this time so that the, uh, the demo doesn't go too long. I'll move that into the, the genomics folder. Again, we're going to create a background task. Now again, this is coming cross country and I'll prove it in a second by um, pinging it. And so I'm limited right now by a gigabit internet link. This is all going over the internet. I'm getting about three quarters of that fill. So. Uh, as streams individually finish, we're going to see the bandwidth go back down, but I peaked right there for a second or two at about 750 megabit, which is 75% of a gig E-line, which I think is really impressive when you're trying to move big data actually over the internet. Uh, let's uh, exit out of here, and I will just show you the latency. So if I run a ping against um, US South for SoftLayer, you can see that I've got about a 40 millisecond latency. So, you know, there's no tricks here. Uh, uh, well, we don't need to stop that thing. All right. So now I also mentioned that, you know, researchers and whatnot, they want easy tools. So the web interface is great. It's great for moving files, you know, from um, the object storage to um, a cluster where, where uh, their native HCP tools would access that data. But what if I actually want the data on my laptop? So I want to pull it down, I want to stream it. I've got a laptop here, it's running Windows. Um, I have one of our tools, it's called Cloud Drive. It's mapping, uh, this is a virtual drive letter, so I have that um, an S drive here. If I go back, you'll see I've got my Ceph Jewel, I've got my HCP cluster, I've got my IBM Cause. So let's go back into um, Jewel. This time, why don't we grab a um, media file? So I have a, uh, about a one gig file. It's a media file, it's Big Buck Bunny. It's, it's 1080p um, cartoon. And uh, the way we'll monitor this isn't actually the best, but um, in Windows, they've got the performance tools. We're gonna look at this through the performance tools. Um, all right. So if I right-click this, that should be enough to, to get Windows to start pulling it. And so right off the bat, you can see that I'm, I'm basically hitting gig speed, which I believe is what the virtual NIC in this VM is. Um, 
I can do gig speed. Now, if I had 10 gig um, in, in other labs I've been working with IBM, I've been able to hit maybe, again, that same 2.5 or so. Um, it's all going to be limited by what your local you know, hard drive is, what your NIC is, but this is a technology to remove those bottlenecks. And so what I advise, I, I see that I'm out of time, but what I advise is that if you want to move your data faster, then what you need to do is parallelize the, the data streams. If you have tons of small files, then you're probably okay with some of the, the tools that exist out there today, Swift Client, AWS CLI, Swift Commander. But if you're looking for an enterprise solution that's going to be able to handle encryption, it's going to be able to parallelize the data, it's going to give you a graphic user interface, have tools for Mac, Windows, Linux, iOS, Android, then stop by the Storage Made Easy booth uh, we've got a number of people that can explain to you what our file fabric is, how it works with Ceph, Swift, and over 60 different types of backend storage, can parallelize your data, um, can allow you to DICOM view MRIs and um, genomic files right inside of it. If there's any questions, I'm glad to answer them. Thank you for your time.